everybody. This is Stephanie Ruper. Thank you so much for tuning into the Naked Humanity podcast, where we take a deep, deep dive into what it means to be human in the modern world. Today is episode number 45, and I have on Paula Larson and Olivia Durand, the two directors of the Uncomfortable Oxford History Project. Now, the Uncomfortable Oxford Project is a walking tour of Oxford that Olivia and Paula have put together, and it showcases and facilitates discussions about parts of Oxford's history that are not often talked about, Uh, things that have to do with uh, racism and classism and sexism throughout the history of Oxford colonialism um, and what I find so brilliant about their approach, we just had a fantastic chat. Uh, I find their approach fantastic because they prioritize conversation, they prioritize listening, they prioritize uh, talking about different opinions and different facts that people know. And so go on this tour and basically go to their few stops, uh, several stops, and tell people something that it happened and then facilitate a discussion about it. And so in this way, they're doing so many things that you all know that I've told you so many times are so important to me. They're breaking down the barrier between, you know, who does history and who doesn't the academic and uh, people who aren't academics. And uh, they're having conversations that aren't accusatory or angry or necessarily even taking a stance or trying to convince people of a certain fact or political position, but are rather just saying, we need to be thinking critically about why our world is the way it is and, you know, how we understand who we are and maybe what we want to do about it. But they're basically just talking about history. You know, we, I think often if we're not critical about how history is done, we learn narratives in high school or what have you. We, we tell these stories that we've heard hundreds and hundreds of times, but there's so many other stories uh, that happen at the same time that need to be told. And we also need to really understand how much our world has been shaped by past events that have been characterized by both good and bad and, you know, whatever (laughs) things that have, that have happened throughout history. And, uh, this this can shed so much light on the way our world is today uh, and, and how we want to relate to it, you know, and it can help us better empathize with other people and why their worlds are the way they are and all that sort of stuff. And so today's conversation is enlightening and it's also really fascinating because we learn some of these things about Oxford's history and England's history and also challenging the status quo, challenging the way that we have historically you know, thought about or done history or or thought about our worlds. So um, if you have put any thought into the past or any thought into the present and why it is the way it is today, I so much recommend uh, tuning into this podcast, which I just find uh, really enlivening. Um, I'll read you a little bit about the directors before we jump into it. Uh, Paula Larson is a co-founder of the Uncomfortable Oxford Project. She is a PhD candidate in the Wellcome Unit for the History of Medicine here at the University of Oxford in the UK. Her research focuses on the history of eugenics in Canada with a particular focus on the intersections of ethnicity and policy in the past century. Olivia, the other founding director, is a co-founder of the Uncomfortable Oxford Project. She is a PhD candidate in the Center for Global and Imperial History at the University of Oxford in the UK here. Her research focuses on the history of the port cities of New Orleans and Odessa in the 19th century, with a particular focus on their relationship with settlement and immigration. Uh, And so as Paula and Olivia will tell you in a little bit, they actually didn't meet in the history faculty, uh, but they met uh, working on their ideas and public engagement, um, actually in a summer school that I did uh, a couple months ago, where people from Oxford come together and try to figure out how to be having these really interesting conversations that we have in the academy everywhere or anywhere. And so um, it's very cool. They've built this fantastic walking tour that happens 
uh, more often than not, you know, many days of the week uh, and is expanding quickly into other corners of Oxford that they'll tell you about. And we're looking, they're looking into expanding into uh, many different cities and universities in parts of the world. And that's just so cool. And one more note before we get started, you know, it's called uncomfortable uh, because there are things, these two reasons, I think this is my interpretation. A, there are uncomfortable things about confronting histories that we maybe didn't know all that much about. Uh, Learning how much the worlds that we live in have been created by suffering or injustices or or what have you, um, or just sort of understanding that maybe your perspective is not the only perspective, right? There's a lot that's uncomfortable there. And also, um, it can be uncomfortable to have hard conversations, but I think generally speaking, Olivia and Paula and their whole team, which is now quite large, they've grown rapidly in the last 12 months since this project was started. Um, you know, I think that they're really seeing that people love having these conversations, you know, are really enjoying um, what they're doing here. And I just, I think it's so important. I love, I love it. I think it's so important um, and brilliant. And I have been looking for a very long time for a person or people to bring onto the podcast to sort of provide an introduction to history and how we understand the past and, and the world today and doing it in an interesting way. And I think that these Uh, two really fantastic people knock that out of the park. So I really want to jump into it. If you have any questions, of course, you know where to find me and you know how to uh, be in touch uh, with the podcast at um, nakedhumanity.org or you can get at me on all of the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I am Stephanie Ruper. This is Naked Humanity and forthcoming is the Uncomfortable Oxford Project, which may historically at least uh, rock your worlds. Thank you so much for tuning in. Here we are, Olivia and Paula of Uncomfortable Oxford. Okay. uh, Welcome, Olivia and Paula. Normally, uh, I can jump right in and ask people deep questions about why they do what they do. Perhaps first you can just say hi individually and let us know mm-hmm. who you are, what you're up to. Um, all right. Well, hello. My name is uh, Olivia Durant. I'm a PhD student in history at the University of Oxford. And my PhD is in global and imperial history. And I focus more specifically on settler societies and settler expansion in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. My name is Paula Larson, and I'm a DPhil in history as well. I'm also studying colonial history, although I'm from Canada, and I study history of Canadian medicine and its impact on Indigenous and immigrant communities. Great. And DPhils are PhDs? Yes, in Oxford okay. they are. Great. <laughs> yeah, that's like because, yeah, no one knows what a DPhil is. Yeah, Oxford likes to be special sometimes. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, when I first came to Oxford, I was very worried that getting a DPhil was not a PhD. I had to, I had to call people and get a lot of reinsurance. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Lovely. So, did you meet because you both sort of study colonialism? Uh, no, actually, we did not know each other despite having studied the same subject in the same university for about two years at the yeah, time. We'd true. never met. Yeah. No, we met because we're interested in doing things knowing how to do things with our research outside of the classroom, basically. Mm -hmm. So we met at the Public Engagement Summer School in the summer of 2018. And uh, it was a week-long summer school, but throughout the week, we had to think about the project that we would want to to pitch at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we came up with this idea. Um, Olivia had just been on a walking tour in Berlin that was on... Was it uncomfortable? It was a post-colonial walking tour in one neighborhood in Berlin. Yeah, and um, I was already a tour guide in Oxford, and we had this great conversation about how we should pitch a uncomfortable tour of Oxford together, which we did, and we did not succeed at the win. <laughs> at the end, we did not win the pitch. <laughs> but the idea is, was that Oxford is a, a city and a university that have been around for such a long time. It has had an influence in so many parts of the globe, and yet it's a very walkable city. So it's kind of the perfect place to have those conversations and to make them accessible to a very wide range of people. Mm-hmm. So uh, we, you, we mentioned I used the word colonial. You said post-colonial, and um, 
you also mentioned like these histories in Oxford. And so can you just sort of like unpack like what are these terms and how is, why is it that we, they're usually uncomfortable? Uh, yes. So we, I guess you could say post-colonial history would be the best term for what we do. Um, but it is more than just post-colonial. We talk about anything uncomfortable that is tied to some sort of history in Oxford, such as the, the class differentiations, the, well, for instance, the elitism, race, wealth, uh, a lot of the power that goes into the university. And we talk about how those histories are still present in the modern sense mm-hmm. in the city and in the student experience and also the, the community experience here. Yeah, I think a lot of people um, are very sensitive to all the colonial uh, stories that we tell in the tour, and they're very important because it's an important part of the history of Oxford, and Oxford has a very important role to play in the history of the British Empire in terms of the people we sent into the British Empire. But we specifically chose to call the tour Uncomfortable Oxford, not Postcolonial Oxford, mm. because there are so many more issues, and that allows us to have a more intersectional approach to all those questions. Awesome. Uh, What do you mean by intersectional? Yeah, so we talk about not just um, one class, we talk about class, gender, and how they intersect. We talk about race and how that intersects with those conversations and how there's always more and more uh, nuance that you can add to these conversations that are not based on just basic class relations, race relations, gender relations, globalism, (laughs) any sort of one one idea fits all. So it's... I mean, everybody obviously has a different educational experience, Mm -hmm. but for me personally, growing up, I was never exposed to questions. Of course, we studied the history of slavery, but you're never really exposed to how those histories play out over time, how they influence the modern world. And so there's a sense in which like this history is uncomfortable, maybe because people haven't heard it before, Mm -hmm. right? Like people often, we know that history is like written by the victors or how does that like saying go, I don't know, history is written by... By the victors, <laughs> by the victors, right? And by the people who win things, right? And so there's, but there's so much else to history that just never really becomes a part of what we commonly hear or talk about, right? I think that's a common reaction we also have on the tours that lots of people, well, British people, will say that it's something that was barely covered uh, mm-hmm. in the classroom in secondary school. Mm-hmm. People who are not from Britain will also compare with their own knowledge about the history of their own countries. Mm-hmm. And I think what we try to do as well in the tours is to use the city as a text because we look at statues, we look at buildings and trying to see how we can think about how the statues, uh, why they are there, how those buildings were built, what are the ties with other histories, how they tie into kind of questionable money sometimes. And we also talk a lot about renaming. Why do we see some names on the streets, some names of the buildings and what would it change if we had the names of the victims maybe or if we had some significant uh, renaming process happening. I think that's another aspect of the uncomfortable conversation. It's not just uncomfortable because you didn't know what happened but it's uncomfortable because you know that in some ways today we're still benefiting from these systems itself and that's uncomfortable to recognize, um, to talk about, to, to even create some sort of discussion about how and why England is so economically powerful in the world, for instance, or America or Canada or many Western countries in general. Yes. <laughs> yeah, France yes. as well. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So in the practice of doing history uh, and sort of studying these colonial or the British history, it's funny, every, it's weird to talk about the UK because so many of my guests are, are from the States. It's very important. Um, how, like, what sort of challenges are there to trying to wrap your head around all these different stories and make them sort of, do you try to make them into a, like, coherent, you know, single singular story of how the city of Oxford or any city came to be? Do you try to, do the narratives have to stay separate? Like, how do you sort of do the work of history knowing that there's so much complexity to it? That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply curious about it. Are you asking us maybe about our methodology, going about maybe uh, setting up a, a tour or how we think about the, the itinerary and the topics we want to talk about? Maybe? Uh, yeah, let's definitely start there and then we can move yes, into postmodernism. Maybe that could be yeah. <laughs> 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 Great. Yes, well, obviously, we would have to 
take into account first and foremost the practical side of things has to be workable. It has to last like if it's longer than an hour and a half, people will just like they'll yes. drop out. So yeah. they're practical first, but then we don't want repetition. Sometimes there are things that can we want to each stop to add some nuance to the conversation to basically bring a different perspective on it. So oh, we've already talked about uh, racism and what does it next up? What does it, what happens when we bring class in addition to race prejudice mm -hmm. and what does it bring to the conversation if you add gender? And so each time we try to move the conversation a, a little notch deeper. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting when we have an international audience, so we have a mix of British people, mix of students and also tourists from different countries, well, it's at the start of the tour, because they are conversation-based, that's also something that's quite important to mention, that we try to create discussions during those tours. We ask people where they are from, and very often that helps us tie into other conversations about things happening in other countries. So Americans very often, when talk about the Cicero statue, will then will then bring the debate mm -hmm. on the Confederate statues mm -hmm. in the U.S. Yeah. And similar conversations in Canada, too, about statues of, of our founding fathers, if you will, being taken down. So one nice thing about the tour, which we hadn't mentioned previously, is it's not just a walking tour. It's actually a discussion tour. We walk from spot to spot, but you are required to participate in a discussion upon the tour. Mm -hmm. Not required, I guess, but most people want to. Um, but it is, it's not just here we are with knowledge that we want to give to you as tour guides. It's actually here is a statue of a person who did these things. Now, what do you think about that? How does this affect the space? How does this affect the location? And so when you have that first starting point, as Olivia has said here, you can start with a conversation and then build at the next stop on the previous conversation that just happened. And you'll have so many different perspectives to be handling too that adds naturally that layer of nuance. You know, you'd asked, is it, I guess, how do you add the complexity in when there's just so much to talk about in Oxford? And one of the struggles, of course, was, was creating a tour that was cohesive because there's so much intersectionality. There's so such a deep history. I mean, you can go from 1100s all the way to today and you'll still find consistently certain things that have existed in the city and you walk by them on the tour. But um, one thing we did find was that it's a walking tour, which means that it's not like you're writing an article. You're not reading something. So you can't expect certain points to stick. People take away what they choose to take away based on what they choose to hear, what they choose to say, and what they choose to hear and say changes every tour. So actually what we're really hoping to do is more than give information, create tools of, of critical analysis. And that's what creates this narrative is that if you're critically analyzing as you go, no matter what you choose to analyze, you're at least walking away with that tool at the end of it. And that's more so important than just what information we've given to you on this tour. Mm. In general, people will remember the points that they've been, if they've been involved in one of the debates, that's what they will take out mm. with them. And they'll keep thinking about those questions. We've received emails of people who, after taking the tour, would write to us and say, yeah, keep thinking about those questions. Or now I'm actually raising those points when I'm walking on the streets with my friends. Mm. And I think people, if you're on a tour, I mean, myself, if I'm on a tour, there's always a moment when I zone out, when I stop listening, because that's just how we are. It's the same oh. as a conference, the same it's as a lecture. It's, it's always easy. the same. But if you are if you are engaged personally, you will remember it because you had a conversation. You often remember things because you're just thinking, oh, this person told me that, or I, I know this because someone told me, I can't remember the exact circumstance, but I remember having this conversation. Mm. And we, I think that's kind of the methodology behind the tour is really making people think personally about those topics. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that I, I really like, that's obviously a very thoughtful approach, right? It's something that you have um, arrived at after a lot of work, I feel very strongly about not like just trying to give people facts. You know, I think you're right because there's so many different contexts, right? You have these conversations here in Oxford and then people can go home and be like, well, actually I wonder, you know, I wonder what is sort of under the surface here. You know, what, what am I not seeing? Um, and I think that that's so healthy and to do it in a way that is not antagonistic. You know, obviously I think a lot of people 
will initially encounter something that says, well, I'm going to teach you that there are ugly parts to your history. We know we're going to be discussing our privileges. And all of a sudden, you're, uh, it's very easy to be defensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, unfortunately, you probably, I, and feel free to not answer this if you want. Um, maybe you have to like work really hard to make it clear that you want to be having discussions, right? Make it clear that you don't want to be antagonistic. Um, I think that's pretty obvious once we start, to be honest. I know that if somebody hears about the uncomfortable tour, their first reaction is probably to assume that they're going to go on and feel incredibly guilty about everything that ever happened in history. (laughs) Um, But that's not what the tour is at all. And when someone comes on it, they learn that. They learn that it's not about shame or guilt. It's about conversation and how to work forward. And so pretty quickly on the tour, because it's not a tour where we say we are right, we have the right information. It's a tour where we say, what do you think? And that is what's really important is that they learn that it's what they think that makes a difference. It's, it's we're giving this space to everybody in that conversation. It's really important for us as academics to, to not be the only person speaking in the room at all times. And that, yeah, that is what the whole tour does. And it says, actually, your knowledge is just as valid. Your opinion is just as valid. And this is a time when we can question all of our opinions, all of our knowledge, and come to a better discourse about a conversation that is very uncomfortable to have. Yeah, and in general, I mean, when there are conversations that are thought as uncomfortable, people avoid to talk about it because, oh, it's uncomfortable. It's also something that people say. It's a word that people use a lot in Britain, which is the way we chose it. But when we, when people come on the tour, first we do highlight that there's going to be discussions that people might not agree. But the goal is to create dialogue rather than having everybody in the corner not talking about those things because mm-hmm. it feels uncomfortable. And also the questions we ask are open questions. It's not about who's wrong or right. It's not about facts, it's about opinions really. And we're always trying, so sometimes there are some groups that are very, most people have the same opinion. So we try to show the spectrum of opinions So our role as guides is to kind of highlight the diversity of opinions that exist and why there is still so much debate about those topics because there's this variety of opinions. And then again, when we train our guides, we really, really emphasize the fact that it's not about what they think themselves. And obviously they have their own private personal opinion, but they are there as facilitators and moderators Mm -hmm. to create this space for discussions. So nice, so nice. Um, I think that's really great. Do you have, uh, sometimes I think it's helpful for people to get a, you know, an understanding of what it's like. Do you have any examples of um, say, places that you go, events that you talk about in history that can sort of demonstrate this intersectionality you've talked about or how people, you know, how you facilitate the discussion there. It's okay if you don't. We need to have so many examples. I know, it's hard to, to pick one. <laughs> would we choose Balin or Chira? Um I think we could mention both, but briefly. So sure. uh, how about I do Belio? How about you start with Belio and I'll take on Tara. Okay, good. So uh, Belio is an interesting one, but Belio is a college in Oxford, just to give some context, that's one of the oldest ones, was um, founded in the, in the 13th century. And, uh, and when we go to Belio, we actually talk about the opening of the student body after 1871, when the University Test Act was passed. So basically, you didn't have to be a member of the Church of England to study at Oxford. So I mean, before that... You, it, the student body was obviously mostly male, but also mostly Anglican, so there wasn't much diversity. And after that date, you have lots of students coming from all around the world, mostly the British colonies. And you also have students coming from the rest of the British uh, Isles and who are coming uh, from Scotland, for instance, and who had a poor background. And this is a very good stop to highlight the intersection between race and class prejudice especially when talking about the reactions of some students, some wealthy white students coming to the college, having studied at Eton before, who would, even though they were shocked about, uh, they were shocked with the diversity of the college, would become friends with uh, sons of Indian princes or students coming from wealthy families in the British colonies, but would very much despise students from lower class backgrounds Mm -hmm. and you can see it in the patterns of pranks and hazing rituals and most of the victims were actually at that point students from a poorer background that kind of and we talk a lot about racism in the previous stops in the tour 
And this is one of the, I think maybe the sixth or seventh stop. And so nice moment to kind of compli complicate the narrative and bring class in. And at the end, we finish on a memorial that exists in front of one of the largest shopping centers here. And if you walk around Oxford, you'll find a number of war memorials. They are everywhere. They're very well maintained. They're beautiful. We have ceremonies in memory of the First World War and Second World War quite often, but not at this memorial. This memorial is not very well maintained, actually. It's falling apart in lots of cases. You can't even read on the front what it's for. And after research, we found that it was for the Tira campaign, which happened in what is modern day Pakistan, but at the time, Northern British India. And it is a colonial war that happened. And it's the very first war memorial ever put up in Oxfordshire to men of Oxfordshire, local community men who died in this conflict abroad in the British Raj. And that memorial is not very well maintained. In fact, you can't even tell what it's commemorating. And when you stand in front of it with a group of people and say, what do you think this memorial is for? The first response you get is well, First World War, maybe, Second World War. And that's because we maintain the First and Second World War memorials. Those are memories we want to have in Britain. But the Tehran Memorial has been left to decay. And that's a very poetic discussion of how Britain handles its colonial past. It's been left to, to just decay, to be forgotten, much like this memorial has. The, the whole square has changed. It's a shopping center. It's a place to feed pigeons. It's a place to, for people to drink at night, generally. Oh, it's by where people feed the pigeons. Yes. Okay. It's the <laughs> nobody knows it exists there, and nobody knows why it's there, and it's not written on the front at all what it's for. But it's a very, uh, I think, interesting visual representation of, of the way in which uh, there's a conscious choice to maintain something or to not maintain something. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Well, I obviously need to go on the tour. So... <laughs> um, Lovely. So you are thinking about expanding, are you not? Always, everywhere. <laughs> the world. Yes. I love it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Other cities everywhere. Uncomfortable everybody, everything. <laughs> everybody having conversations, finally talking to each other. Yes. So let's fix all yes. the, <laughs> the lack of conversations about important topics. Well, it's so hard, you know, like there, there's this saying, right, about religion and politics and you should never discuss them, but maybe that's a really big part of a problem is that mm -hmm. We just don't discuss them. And perhaps that's especially true in Britain in certain ways or in parts of the world where it's just like you focus on being polite as opposed to vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really what we sort of need is for people to be capable of being vulnerable in conversation with one another. Yeah. And a lot of the things we do on our tour is actually well, how we train our guides is so when you have these conversations, not to to take a, a strong stance. It's not actually about what you think. It's about what they think. It's to ask them what they think, to ask somebody else their opinion, because those uncomfortable conversations are only uncomfortable because you don't know where your side is coming from or the other side is coming from. And the more that you understand where someone is coming from, the more you are likely to be able to either change their mind, agree with them, or see where it is their perspective has been created from. And that helps you and gives you a tool going forward to understand when you go to another conversation, likely where that opinion has come from. And it can be opinion on any spectrum really, but we do questions mostly in our conversations. So that way the conversation, if you question someone, it often keeps it from ex escalating really quickly because I mean, the biggest fear everybody has in an uncomfortable conversation is that it's going to escalate into an argument and not a conversation. And to take someone down from an escalation is to ask them a question, is to ask them why. The more they have to, to explain why, the calmer they'll become about that opinion and the more they'll self-analyze where it actually comes from. Mm. Yeah, it's a, I mean, the question, the, I think the question method has been the best way to handle all those conversations so far. Mm -hmm. We have very rarely had very adverse people come actually on the tour. Uh, most of the people who don't like what we do just write comments or send trolls emails. <laughs> but they would not actually come on the tour, even though that would be great. It would be great. We'd love to have them. But uh, obviously, there are people with very different opinions who come on the tour, people who have been living in Oxford for decades, people who are from different uh, countries, different age groups, people who are linked to the university and some who have no idea at all about the University of Oxford. Mm -hmm. And they'll come from very, with their own stories and having those questions first allow us to understand better where they come from, why they have this opinion, but it also allows them to, they just put a bold statement out there because some people like to just have a bold statement, yeah. just say something a little bit provo provocative. Yeah. And then they just 
start questioning, okay, why did I say this? Where does it come from? Why do I have those ideas? And little by little, we can, especially with some of the comments, just as like, oh, the past is the past or something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, they end up, a lot of people end up realizing that it's just, oh, because it's my opinion. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's more valid than other opinions. And then we can, in a way, continue the conversation. So it's, mm -hmm. not, too, it's not disruptive. It's actually a very good learning moment for all the people mm -hmm. uh, in, in the tour. It gives everybody's experience a, a unique space as well. Because if, if my experience is to walk through Oxford as an individual who's British and who's lived here for a long time and see the beauty of the, the city and see the like wonder and that believe in the, like the power of the knowledge. That's a, an experience that is a completely valid experience and needs to be talked about. Just as the person who walks through Oxford and finds an oppressive, pl a, a, oppressive? oppressive place, uh, walks through Oxford and sees locations they're not allowed to walk into, sees mm -hmm. closed doors everywhere and sees not a single individual who's basically not British and white. And that's another uh, valid experience that needs to be given space. And if you can put both of those experiences into a conversation, suddenly both of them learn a lot more about that city they live in and the shared spaces they have and how they can change depending on who you are and what it is. And it's not, again, it's not about us as guides, what we think about that. It's about the fact that you can create that conversation between two people from very different backgrounds. And so they're able to talk about how they both have valid experience that need to be talked about that can be painful, can be hard, can be wonderful in their own ways, can be horrible in others and can have an impact on the way that it's going in the future, which is eventually what we want to change. And that's why the walking tour aspect is very essential. So some people have uh, suggested, oh, you should do an interactive map. You should have some little podcasts for each stop that people can listen to and just do some guided tours. Mm -hmm. But we are very reluctant about it. We think the conversation and the conversation with other people, part of the tour is what makes it quite special. It's not just about finding out some uncomfortable fact and leaving people with those facts feeling uncomfortable. That's not productive at all. Mm -hmm. And also for some people experiencing a sense of shame is not going to bring anything positive, anything constructive out of the tour. What's very important is to have those conversations within a group of people, with some people they might not know, and then having this experience and then repeating it, mm -hmm. taking it out of the tour and doing it themselves with their own friends and families and basically creating more uh, critical thinking about the space we live in and how it came into being, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You asked us if we wanted to expand, sorry. Oh, yes. We tangentially left that whole conversation behind. Uh, I don't even, uh, no, uh, it's good. We wander. We do wander. <laughs> and always wander. Much like a wander walking tour. <laughs> the, the expansion is more having, because of the practical limits of the walking tour, the fact that it shouldn't be longer than maybe... Uh, two miles or even two miles too long, two kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, it should not last longer than an hour and a half or very often just a little bit longer, but like it's an hour and a half because of the discussion bit. It's maybe eight to nine stops. It's not that much. It just mm -hmm. takes a while. So our way of expanding is to do more research and do different itineraries. So we have a general uncomfortable tour, uh, which is try trying to be quite comprehensive about all the topics it covers. It covers colonialism, obviously, mm -hmm. but also uh, sexism, racism, class struggle, or questions of access, uh, the tension between the town of Oxford and the university. But then we also have some specialized tour mm -hmm. on an uncomfortable finance and sources of funding. Yes, we just started the uncomfortable finance tour, um, which talks about donations and the ethics behind receiving large financial donations to the university and what that means ethically and who you choose to take money from, who you don't choose to take money from, who then gets their name on buildings and what does that represent, which is a very hot topic considering the big deal with Sackler, for instance, in America right now and the Purdue Pharma trials that are happening. And of course, we have the Sackler Library here in Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have other specialized tours too, which we've started expanding into. Um, well, we have Oxford and Empire because again, colonialism and just British Empire, Empire. <laughs> could just be its own tour in Oxford. Okay, and we five did tours. <laughs> so we did make a, a specialized tour on Oxford and Empire trying to really look at those intersections. Mm -hmm. So how obviously people have imperial carriers, but also how some of the schools and also some of the departments 
uh, how their foundation and their development was a very closely linked with the development of the British Empire mm -hmm. and the purposes of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, Uncomfortable Ashmolean. Sure. Yeah. So we've started going into the museums, of course, which would be very great once the weather turns into normal English winter weather. Rain every day, although it is great on the Uncomfortable Tour. Um, but we now do the Ashmolean itself once a month. Um, we're hopefully to expand that in future as well. We're having some talks soon with the Ashmolean about making it more common and more frequent. Mm -hmm. But then we've been talking with Pitt Rivers about possibly designing one for them as well, which is the Anthropology Museum for anybody who's been to Oxford. It is full of quite a few artifacts that are taken for various cultures around the world. Um, and then also potentially the Botanic Gardens and the libraries and other inside yes. locations. And then obviously it would be great to design those kind of for colleges specifically, we have one college specific uh, uncomfortable tour. It's Wadham College. Wadham College is one of yeah. the, the colleges in Oxford that has the most liberal uh, reputation. And they asked us to, to kind of research the history of the college, its alumni, its buildings, and so on, and to design a college specific tour. So it's a little bit short, it's about an hour, but it's the first and only college so far that has asked us to do this. And each college has such a wealth of history and alumni. And because colleges are such close spaces, we wouldn't be able to do it on the normal tours. The normal tours, we don't go into buildings around the streets. Mm -hmm. So there's still so much more to unpack within each individual college. So it's ever expanded and growing. And then hopefully, you know, every city in the UK and then to every major university across the Western world and, you know, I mean, across Europe, really. Let's, uh, let's analyze everything. I mean, France, cities like Bordeaux or Nantes would really benefit from something like this. Mm. <laughs> Is that... Bordeaux, I'm, 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 from, I'm from the south of France, more on the Mediterranean side, even though Marseille could also be a very interesting one. Just at the bottom of the main train station of the city is this very uh, gigantic stair, uh, this very gigantic, gigantic stairs. At the bottom, you have two statues of two women lying down. One is representing the French colonies in Africa. So it's a, a woman who has traits of... Uh, generic African woman that's also quite sexualized. She uh, wears very little clothes, has a lot of jewelry on her, and she's just like lavishly sitting, uh, like, lying down. And on the other side, it's for the French colonies in Indochina. And similarly, you have a woman with um, some traditional jewelry lying down and mm -hmm. at the bottom of the main, uh, like the stairs leading to the main train station of the city. And no one notices it. <laughs> mm. Intersectionality, gender. Yes. Yes. Orientalism. Orientalism. Let's see yeah, all of those conversations. Right. Very cool. Do you find, are people surprised by the approach that you take? I, I feel like in our very sort of polarized political landscape, people tend to think that if you mention racism, gender, what have you, class, you're going to try to be shaming them, right? You're going to be trying or, um, people sort of enter into these conversations. It's so easy to be easily, I just said easy twice, so easy to be defensive, right, at the outset. And so um, do you, are, I know people come on the tour expecting to be having these conversations, but are you finding that you're like hitting these sort of polarized opinions of how history is done or talked about today? Um, on the actual tour, we don't often get very much of a polarized discussion. It's just it because we question everybody and everything, no matter what spectrum they come from, to make that a conversation, to, to, to have people analyze their own beliefs. Uh, it's it's quite a good space. It always deflates any sort of polarization that happens. Mm. We don't actually think many people expect to have a conversation, although we try to advertise it's discussion-based. I think just the fact that it's an uncomfortable tour has kind of convince people it's a walking tour as it is um, mm -hmm. and they don't go on assuming they're going to have somebody talk at them for the whole time and actually that changes the dynamic pretty quickly once you get on it but the most polarization we ever get is when someone hasn't been on the tour right. when someone doesn't know what it's about or how what approach we take and you know we had this article come out yes. very recently in the sunday times which was great great publicity and and our reporter was on the tour olivia gave that to her and the comments were probably the most polarized we've gotten so far yeah, no, it was a very interesting, I mean, you know, you should never read the comments, obviously we did. Uh, 
within hours, we were like, we have to read the we comments. Also, it's quite, you know, it's, it's, it did, there are lots of comments. It means that people react to those kind of stories. Mm-hmm. But most of the, well, some comments were positive. It's, you know, some of them were positive. But the amongst the, the negative ones, it was either very um, personal. Mm-hmm. So telling us that we are oh, we are foreigners. So we're we should, not. British, we should go if home. Not talk thankful. about our own countries. <laughs> if we're not thankful, we should just go home. Mm-hmm. What right do we have to analyze the place we live in? Right. Uh, also, strangely, because Canada's a former British colony. I feel like a lot of people forgot that. In the- yeah, and that's so, like we we are living in Oxford. We're sitting at the university. We've mm-hmm. been here for a few years. It's the place we live in. Like it's where I live. I don't live in France. I haven't lived in France in quite a few years. But yeah. Oh well. And the other the other other criticism would be people saying, why do you always have to bring up the past? Let's look at all the horrible things that are happening today. Uh, for instance, on the African continent, actually yeah. blaming uh, countries and their on governments. the African continent for the situation they are in today because they have dictatorships or bad uh, political or military regimes. And not even... Like, even... Uh, understanding that there is a reason why oh, yeah. it's the case today, yeah. why some countries are in worse economic and mm-hmm. political situations than others, why countries in mm-hmm. Europe are in quite, even, even though there's a lot of political strife in Europe as well, they are actually quite well off as far and, as the world economy is yes. concerned. And no. those reactions are just basically. Yeah, you can sum them up as the past is in the past and you're just party poopers. <laughs> Although if that person came on the tour, if someone came on the tour and said, well, why are you talking about Cecil Rhodes, for instance, today, when look at how problematic different governments in Africa are, then the response you would have would be say, well, why do you think those governments are problematic today? And, and why? And mm-hmm. then eventually they're going to come down to a point where they say, well, maybe because... Britain used to be in control of a lot of those governments and so were other European powers and they yeah. were colonized and that leads to these conversations. But that tells us where we need to start. I mean, those are the, the beliefs that's out there. It was actually really enlightening to see the different responses you get from a general public about the fact we're talking about colonial history in Oxford or, or any sort of uncomfortable history in Oxford. And that gives us a starting point to say, well, actually, we just need to ask them that one question. Mm-hmm. That one question will take them down the rabbit hole really quickly themselves. We don't have to do it. As long as somebody asks that question to them, they'll eventually, you know, people are intelligent. They can figure things out themselves, especially if they're starting to question themselves, which is why we do this mm-hmm. question method. But that's also why it's important that people like this come on the tour because those conversations mm-hmm. can never be had if you just answer to a comment or something. Like this. If you <laughs> yeah. try to start writing, you can't have a conversation because people feel very protected there behind their screen. Mm. Uh, there's no way you can really reach the same level of understanding that you can reach on the tour. And you also yeah. can't say those things too to just people on the streets that you've never talked to before, which is another beauty of the tour is that suddenly you're in a space where you have real people that have also got their own real experiences. And if you tell, you know, well, any person on the street, your very vivid belief about you know, the African continent being not as good as Europe, which is what those comments said many times, then you will pretty much have to deal with the consequences of that pretty quickly, unlike in the internet where you can get away with saying that a thousand times. So that's another wonderful thing about the tour. We would love those people to come on our tour. That would be the perfect situation to have all of them on the tour, having conversations with other people, other academics, <laughs> other townsfolk. We should invite them. I don't know how. <laughs> but if we could, we should. Maybe they'll invite themselves. I feel like I want to put some thought into it as well. I feel like it's, yeah, I don't know. It's possible, I think. And something I often think about when I encounter these kinds of comments, uh, my history class in high school, when our history teacher asked us, why do we do history? And literally every single person in the class wrote down their answer so we can learn from mistakes of the past. And that was just the idea that we all had. And everybody like read them aloud. And the teacher at the end was like, well, what do you guys think about the idea that we study history so we know why the world is the way it is today? And everyone was like, oh, <laughs> right, that, right. Like that yeah. makes sense. But I also, I think once we realize that we also 
understand or have feelings about the fact that then maybe we have some sort of like obligation, right? Or our world has to change. If we understand that there is like some sort of inherent injustice or inherent problem with how things came to be, then maybe we have to do something about it. And I mm-hmm. think that that's probably a little bit scary. Oh, it's terrifying. I mean, especially when you have everything in the world right now, which is the privilege of being born in a Western country with white skin and a fairly middle income background. It's terrifying to have to confront that reality and to recognize your own privilege and to say that it's not okay. And I shouldn't be benefiting from problems that are still in place today, which stem from the past. Um, but when you recognize it and suddenly I find it's quite cathartic to just, to just recognize it, to say, yeah, I, I am so lucky. You know, I, I was given these wonderful things in the world. Other people were not. And how can I find a way to also bring them a, a better future? That's, I already have that. I'm already going to have that. And it's also, I think, uh, for us being uh, PhD students or training to, to become academics and mm-hmm. researchers, it's also a good exercise in, in humility and recognizing where we stand and that obviously we don't have all the answers. And I think well, well, all of our guides for the, the tours are all uh, Oxford, uh, University of Oxford students because we think it's very important that the public, so the public can be other students, right? Can be academics and can be tourists. We don't know who the public is going to be because anyone can sign up for a tour. But it's important that the public has those conversations with people who are members of the University of Oxford, mm-hmm. even though it's not an official University of Oxford project. It's its own. Uncomfortable Oxford is it, its own uh, social enterprise, really. But it's important to have those conversations with people who are in this institution that has majorly benefited from the past, from exploitation in the past and also exploitation in the present in some ways. And I think for the the guides, it's also a very good uh, intellectual exercise to also realize at a a personal level why they are here and where they stand and the power they have as students of the University of Oxford and what they can do about it. There's so much power that goes into it. And I feel like many international students come in here and suddenly you're immersed in this system that has been in place for quite a long time in in England and has changed. I mean, it's changed, but it's changed in ways that are very slow and complicated and messy. And a lot of people don't really get the ability to talk to the public while they study here. And they then lose out on the fact that they are supposed to be academics engaged with the world. There's many academics in our department or in other departments that are very, very, how do I say this? Do not very often have conversations with the regular person on the street. And that is a thing that I think they're missing out on. Because first of all, the person on the street has lots of really great things to say, really interesting perspectives, but it creates this isolationist belief that this academic ivory tower, which is named after Oxford, um, is for some reason an isolated space and should stay that way. Mm -hmm. And this is us saying, well, actually, as academics, we shouldn't be isolated. We should be the ones who are having conversations with the world about the things we research, about the things we found, about the things that we see and understand and want to learn more about. And we should be talking to the world about those ideas instead of just to each other about those ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's like students or academics at the University of Oxford were so lucky to be in our position. Mm-hmm. They were so lucky to benefit from this education. And what we should really do is kind of open up the benefits of this education and try to do mm-hmm. something about yeah. it. Really. Yeah. And I think one of the main benefits of this education is it teaches you how to question things, to have those conversations. So and I think it can. <laughs> it can, maybe. And I think the discussion model is also loosely based on the tutorial model you have in Oxford because you have a very strong tutorial system for undergraduate and also graduate students in Oxford where you have those conversations, those very deep conversations with a tutor about something you've researched or so complicated, Mm -hmm. open and essay questions. And we're trying to basically have this kind of pedagogy on the streets. Yeah, I think that's, that's so wonderful. And I wouldn't... It's very tricky because I don't like to normatively tell people that they have to do something or should be doing something uh, that's very uncomfortable for me. But I also personally feel so much 
that like what I need to be doing with my privilege is trying to break down these barriers. The most recent uh, episode of the podcast that was published actually was about academic publishing, um, which is another way. It's not grounded in the physical history of Oxford here, right? But it's another way in which we just like with money, right? With power, like separate the conversations that are happening in the, happening in the world, mm-hmm. you know, and people in the academy are so distressed that conversations that, you know, happen elsewhere don't like participate in the same kind of ideas or the same kind of language. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you're, not, you're not talking to anybody. So um, yeah, I think that that's really important. And I think a lot, I think about this every single time I go to the Radcam, uh, yeah. the Radcliffe camera is one of our prettiest libraries here in Oxford and it's mm-hmm. in the center of everything. Um, and you have to like walk through a gate and up like the walk mm-hmm. by the grass that nobody can step on. I do get upset when people step on the grass. Like I won't lie because I never step on the grass because we by coming, <laughs> we follow it. You by choosing to come here, you're like, okay, I am yeah. choosing to be a part of this system. But on the other hand, the system needs, I think, you know, it needs to be analyzed critically and thought about deeply. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. In a lot of ways, it's just often analyzed and critically discussed within the university walls. And that's one of the reasons why whenever we have an article about us in the newspaper about the University of Oxford, not accessible to anybody, you know, like nothing but elitism and, and prejudice. And it's interesting because so many people are having these conversations within the university, but when are those conversations going to people not in the university and how can we have those conversations across that border, which is the the actual physical walls, which exist all around every building in Oxford. Mm -hmm. And how do we take that step out? Because most people in the university just kind of say, we've already talked about this. We've got these access programs. We've got these training programs. We've got this public engagement initiative. And of course we're doing something. It's just crazy that the BBC didn't pick up on that. (laughs) Um, And so they like, well, who knows that we're doing these things? And when are we doing these things? Are we doing enough of these things? How do we do more of these things and help people know that we're actually trying to make a difference? Yeah, that's also why we set that up as a, as a social enterprise and, a, mm-hmm. and a, as an actual yeah, enterprising project because we started with a festival in the fall uh, 2018 and we did it for 11, 11 days straight. So we had an initial tour. It's not the same that we're doing now. It was way too long. It was two hours and a half. Way too long. <laughs> but you know, there are lots of topics you want to talk about. We're very excited. Uh, and it was the early stages. And there was such a positive response. And there are thinking, most of the public engagement for research that happens within the university takes a lot of time in the making, lots of effort, lots of people collaborating, applying for funding and this and that. Then it all comes together during one festival or one event, one late night, I don't know, at the museum. And then it's over. Mm-hmm. It's over. And there's all this effort and what's the impact and how many people can you reach? So in the end, we set this up as a social enterprise because we are able to train and pay the guides, yeah. student guides who are working on a project. It's a very casual thing to do in terms of time commitment. But we run tours very regularly. We have a minimum of four tours a week uh, over the summer and we'll change a little bit in the fall. But we can, it is there. It is something that's systematic. It's not happening just once a month or once every term of a weekend or something. It's, it's there. It's every week people can come in it and those conversations keep happening. It's an ongoing project and we're not publishing uh, we're not doing a lot of research within the university to publish a report that only academics are going to read. We're creating those conversations with academics as well, with the public, and the public are is also having those conversations with members of the university who come on the tour. Oh, yeah. uh, there was a tour where we had a professor from NYU coming in, mm-hmm. chatting with people who are from the town, and some tourists coming from Portugal and from other countries. Mm-hmm. to make sure that that didn't destroy our file. Oh, right. Very sad. That yes. would be very sad. Um, <sighs> pretty, God, really high. We're, on, we're on fire. I'm sorry. It's today. So the meetings I haven't indexed yet. <laughs> Eight twenty-seven, ten fifty-two. Lovely. 
It has arrived. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. I'll just read. Rewind. So just, I think you're saying NYU professor. And yeah. Then... No, it's so cool. Oh, all right. Well, Hi. I'll have a long, weird break in the middle. Um, so we once had this NIU. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's quite important that the tours run very regularly so that we can have a very diverse public coming on it. That it's something, it's an ongoing project. It mm -hmm. doesn't culminate at some point, just dies off. And it's really nice because we have conversations that would never happen otherwise. And like in one group, we had an NYU professor visiting Oxford alongside some people from the town who had lived here for like many years and some tourists having conversations about roads, about legacies of slavery in Oxford uh, or slave, uh, slave related money in Oxford. And those conversations would never happen in any other context or I, I've never heard of any other context in which it could happen really. Yeah, so it's gonna be, because it's a social enterprise sustainable, which is the most important thing for us. We are finishing up our degrees hopefully this year, and then maybe stick around another year to make sure the project stays and we can expand it everywhere. But generally, then we're going to pass on our positions and this is going to be a permanent feature, as Olivia said, a system of, of at least discussion that will happen on the streets consistently. Um, we're the least expensive walking tour so that it is accessible. Um, and we are here just to make sure that little by little, a few more people are added to that conversation. It's not a one big one-off event but it actually, like, even if it's only four people that day, maybe it'll be 15 people the next day, maybe it'll be 40 another day because we have a few tours running, but it'll always have a few more people who can then take those tools and give them to other people. And that's mm -hmm. what really makes this so important is this, this expansion ability of every person who comes. Even one person coming on that tour is suddenly able to then take those tools with them. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's lovely. Um, do you have anything else? Can you tell people where they can read more about this, where they can follow you? Well, I mean, they can follow us. If people are keen on Twitter, we're on at a Knox project, but the U N O X project. Mm -hmm. So we're on Ox Unorthodox. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you can just Google Uncomfortable Oxford yes. and it'll come up right away with our webpage. Yeah, that's oh. our website, our Facebook. Uh, we update all of them, all, all three of them, Twitter, Facebook, mm -hmm. and the website very, very regularly. They can easily email us through the webpage as well. Very easy to contact. Both of us are also on the Oxford webpage. They can search our names as yes. well. And have our personal emails, but we're very responsive on the on the project email. Yeah, project. yeah. We have over <laughs> now twenty people involved in this project too. It's not just us. So this is it's expanding. That means there's enough people that they can respond to easy messages on Facebook or on email, etc. And it's also why we uh, really set up a social enterprise because it makes it a sustainable project. Mm -hmm. Because if it was just a student society or something like this. We we know how what's the the kind of the the the, the, the road uh, among students and also our students in general and how people can be busy or you know there is people graduate and by setting up a social enterprise it allows us to 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 yeah to be a permanent feature in Oxford hopefully yeah I am um, I'm really excited so thank you so much both of you thank you everybody else for tuning in. I hope it was as edifying for you as it was for me. Um, Y'all know where to find me. I'm at Stephanie Ruber everywhere. And uh, please do be in touch with them first because they're fantastic humans. If you have any other questions that you think I could feel better, please do be in touch with me. You can always email me at stephanie at nakedhumanity.org. Uh, okay. So thank you so much, Olivia and Paula. And thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for having us. We really, really enjoyed this. And for everybody watching. Thanks for listening and watching. Come on the tour. <laughs> chat with us. Yeah. Come, come and chat, chat with us. Chat with us. Visit Oxford. Ask us how to take it to your city. Lovely. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Take care.